Great, thanks very much. So, uh, quick background: I'm a consultant endocrinologist with an interest in pituitary disease, um, which has stemmed back to my research around growth hormone way back in the late 1990s. Um, and acromegaly has been part of what we've continued to do research on ever since, really. So, um, something we've had an interest in um, up in Leeds, where I, I work. So, well get through the presentation now just to give you an idea and we're really talking I suspect a lot of you know a lot about this about acromegaly but we'll fill you in a lot of it and then um, you can ask me anything at the end. So acromegaly when we talk about acromegaly we're not talking about a pituitary and we were talking about a clinical syndrome that's due to far, far too much growth hormone for a long period of time. And that's what it's due to. All the changes we see are due to too much growth hormone. And the word acromegaly comes from um, acro being peripheral and megaly being large. So that's it. And we all know the famous people like Richard Keel, who was Jaws in Moonraker, who had acromegaly, who sadly died about a decade ago now. Um, when people get acromegaly, it's very insidious. It comes on very, very slowly. So people don't notice they've got it and it leads to delays in diagnosis. The classical features we know of anyone who knows people with acromegaly, they have those classical features like uh, Richard here. Um, and we'll go through a few more of those in a minute, exactly what they are. Um, and it has a whole, a whole lot of symptoms attached to them, but they're heterogeneous. There's not something where you think of a symptom and say, oh, that must be acromegaly. So people will say, oh, I feel more tired. Um, I've got aches and pains in my joints, I've got headaches, and they don't lead you initially to think this is definitely acromegaly. So you get symptoms across multiple things, multiple systems, which don't scream out to you acromegaly. One of the negatives to acromegaly is it's been associated with increasing mortality. So we know if we don't treat people with acromegaly, they do badly. They have a mortality rate that is um, about 107 so. Normals one, uh, they have a mortality which is 1.7 fold what the background population is. So really important to diagnose this and treat people. So symptoms, as I say, lots and lots of symptoms um, here. So um, again, some very common symptoms. We've got headaches, fatigue, sweating tends to be something that's uh, very common. Uh, obviously the enlargement of the hands and the feet um, people often, one of the things they'll say is they've had their rings cut off because their hands have got too tight, their shoe size has changed. Um, we often see in, no, in anybody that they can have a change in shoe size of half a size, but this is often two, three sizes people having change in their shoe size, which really is abnormal. Joint aches and pains, very common. Muscle weakness, despite having bigger muscles, they often have weaker muscles. Uh, snoring can be part of it. Deepening of the voice, really common. And obviously it affects sexual function and other hormones can, can cause irregular periods, reduce libido in men, erectile dysfunction. And if we have big tumors, it presses on the nerves to the eyes so you can get visual field defects. And how about signs? Well, here's some of them that people get. You can see in this that, that uh, we've lost older. Andre the Giant over there. Um, he's behind uh, the thing there. Um, we can see Andre the Giant, he's got some of these features. They have super orbital ridges, the bit above, oh, you can see it better on here. On this gentleman in the first picture on the left there, the brows across the eyes are much more prominent. You get wet widening of the nasal bridge, which, which we can again see on, on Andre, the top of the nose becomes widened. Prognathism is where the jaw sticks forward um, more than the, the upper teeth. The lips become larger, as we can see in both of these people. Um, macroglossia means you get a big tongue, and you can see that in the first picture there. There's a very big tongue on that person. Dental separation, we can also see because the jaw gets wider, it pulls the teeth apart, and you get spaces between, which you can see again in this gentleman. Um, the skin becomes a lot more coarse and oily, so just generalized coarsening of the features, particularly the face is one that we notice. Hands and uh, feet become um, enlarged, but the hands, when you feel them, have a doughy and uh, moist appearance to them. So they're one of the most classical features when you meet, meet someone with untreated acromegaly, the, the puffy doughy hands, which often are quite moist. In the things that you don't see, the organs get bigger as well. So the heart and the liver and things like that also get bigger. If we have this condition before the, you've stopped growing, then it can make you grow excessively. And that's called gigantism, which is similar, but it has a few features which are a little different to those of acromegaly.
particularly relating to height. Acromegaly also has a lot of complications. Um, so we know people with acromegaly have an increased risk of high blood pressure, increased risk of diabetes. Carpal tunnel syndrome is where the nerves in the wrist get pressed on, and that causes pins and needles in the hands. Uh, it's a bit very common in acromegaly. Visual impairment, as we mentioned, because the nerves of the eyes can get pressed on by the, any pituitary lumps or bumps. They get problems with the heart, although that seems to be a le lot less common now, because I think that's being screened for and we're better at controlling the, um, the disease. So seen a lot less frequently. We know there's an increase in polyps in the colons that was described around 20 years ago. Um, and although there's polyps definitely increased, there's still debate about whether there's an increase in colon cancer. Sleep apnea, very common, probably up into the 80, 90% of people. And that's because of the increased soft tissue growth in the larynx and the, the pharynx areas, um, which leads to um, obstruction at night when the tissues, when we go to sleep, the tissues become a lot more. Uh, floppy, I suppose, um, and stop the block the airway. And often people wake up several times at night. Bones tend to be thinner, um, so we can get osteoporosis and thin bones, and that's an increased fracture risk that patients get. Um, arthropathy really common. One of the worst um, complications, really, of having acromegaly um, is patients can get joint disease, and it's often premature. It's very similar in its late stages to osteoarthritis, but probably occurs a good ten to twenty years before people would normally get. Uh, significant osteoarthritis. And that's something we've been uh, having an interest in lately of looking at arthropathy. Uh, people generally, because they're medicalized, because of the problems with all the complications and the symptoms obviously have impaired health and quality of life. Um, and then there's hyperpituitism. If you get a lump in your pituitary, you can obviously damage your other pituitary hormones, and we have to think about those as well. How common is it? Well, acromegaly is pretty uncommon. We have about 150 patients in Leeds being a major tertiary centre. We cover about 3 million people um, for that many. Um, and if you take a population of about a million, there's about somewhere between 86 and 137 cases. So on average, probably 100 cases per million people. Um, so in Yorkshire, where we are, 3 million people in West and North Yorkshire, um, we would have about 300 cases. New cases is about six, four to six cases per million people a year. So we're thinking uh, really 12 to 18 cases, new cases every year in Yorkshire. Pretty much all of them are pituitary tumours, but they're not all. It's about 99% have lumps and bumps in their pituitary that are causing this problem with secreting too much growth hormone. Men and women are affected equally. Average age of onset, about 40 to 45, but it affects people at all ages. Uh, we've got people who um, were young and obviously had gigantism when they got it, and we have people in their 80s uh, who have developed this. Most of these lumps and bumps in the pituitary, when we find them, are bigger tumours. About 70% of them are bigger than a centimetre, bigger than 10 millimetres. There are genetics. We've e increasingly found genetics linked to um, acromegaly, um, but they're predominantly in the younger onset. So it's the people who are diagnosed in before, pretty much before the age of 30, um, generally have the um, genetic forms of acromegaly rather than if you're diagnosed older, you're much less likely to have a genetic cause. Then the other 1% out there are tumors, bronchial tumors, bronchial carcinoid tumors or pancreatic tumors, um, which secrete growth hormone releasing hormones. So that's the hormone normally that would be released by your uh, brain to tell the pituitary how to work. And these tumours secrete that hormone and tell the pituitary to make too much growth hormone. But they're rare. I only have one individual um, in Leeds who has a, a GHI secreting bronchial carcinoid. Let's introduce Jack. So this gentleman, uh, 39, he um, was picked up by a doctor, a junior doctor, walked into um, somewhere where this gentleman was working and thought he had acromegaly. So I went back the next day and dropped off a little leaflet to say, excuse me, I think you've probably got this condition called acromegaly and please go and see your GP. Um, and he was right. Um, he had quite a few of the symptoms we recognized. He'd been fatigued for quite a long time, had very bad headaches, excessive sweating on doing very little. And he had all those features when you look at him that make you think this gentleman has acromegaly. Um, he also had carpal tunnel bilaterally in his hands, one of which had already been operated on um, before anyone had picked up his diagnosis. 
He was otherwise pretty well. Um, his only other past history really was he had chronic sinus disease, but otherwise no other diagnosis that he knew about. Clinically, how do we diagnose these people with acromegaly? So if Jack comes to us and we're thinking, uh, have you got acromegaly? How do we diagnose him? Well, obviously the clinical appearance is what we've been um, talking about already. So that's a big clue um, to people who know. But often to people see you regularly, they won't notice those changes because it really is so insidious and the changes are so slow that it usually takes someone who's not seen you for a while to pick this up. On average, we think looking back at old photos, people have probably had the disease for an average eight to 10 years before we actually diagnose them. If you have more of the features of all those symptoms and signs that I've described, then you're more likely to have the diagnosis. So if someone's got diabetes or a bit of blood pressure, then the risk of having acromegaly is very low. But if you've got diabetes and high blood pressure and you've got the somatic features and several of the other things, then you're much more likely to have it. There's not a lot of features which are discriminatory. I think really the ones that tell you people have got acromegaly really are those features when you look at someone. If you've seen a lot of people who have had acromegaly, who've got acromegaly, then, then they're the people who are gonna pick it up. We're only gonna diagnose acromegaly though if people start thinking of the diagnosis. So people need to know about it. And we did a talk for the Paturity Foundation to GPs in July to try and raise the profile of this condition. So hopefully the GPs will think of it. If it's in your mind as a doctor, you're more likely then to diagnose it than if you haven't thought about it for years. So we'll keep trying to tell the primary care and people um, uh, about this condition. Once we have the clinical features, we need to prove they've got it biochemically. To do that, we need to have a think about what the normal growth hormone axis is. So this is um, what normally happens. Our hypothalamus in the brain tells our pituitary gland how to work. It secretes two hormones, one to cause you to secrete growth hormone, one to switch it off. And then the pituitary gland at the base of our brain makes growth hormone, which then goes around in the circulation and acts primarily on the liver here to produce this hormone called IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factor. So these are the two hormones we can measure peripherally, growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1. So if we take that little bit at the pituitary, what's going on? You've got growth hormone releasing hormone. This one acts on the pituitary, from, comes down from the brain, tells the pituitary to make more growth hormone. And then you've got another one that comes down from the brain called somatostatin, which comes down and tells your pituitary not to make growth hormone. And these two work synchronously together. So you, at times you get a switch off of somatostatin and increase in GHRH, which leads to a pulse of growth hormone. So here we have it. These are profiles from normal healthy individuals in this picture here. This is what people's growth hormone do normally. About 75% of our growth hormone normally would be secreted um, in the first two hours of sleep. And the rest of the day, um, a lot of it, as we can see, the flat lines along the bottom are times when the growth hormone levels are so low that you can't actually measure it. And then we measure these little pulses in between. And we can see some people here have pulses that go up to around two um, nanogram per litre and others up to about five. And this person must be very young and healthy because he's got a pulse there going up to about 18. Um, these pulses get smaller and um, at the older we get. So most of the time in healthy individuals without acromegaly, they have growth hormone levels which are unrecordable. Now, oops. A person with acromegaly, if we take this little red line across here, would have a growth hormone level that is consistently high. And that's the difference between normal people and acromegaly. That little lump or bump in the pituitary gland just continuously secretes growth hormone and nothing switches it off. So to diagnose acromegaly, we use the growth hormone and the IGF-1 levels. We can do a random growth hormone level. And if it's low, if it's below 0.3 microgram per liter, then you haven't got acromegaly. Similarly for IGF-1, if we measure your IGF-1 and that's normal, again, you haven't got a diagnosis of acromegaly. When the levels are higher, then we have to think about it a little bit cl more closely and think, do they have acromegaly or not? Because we could, if we've got a growth hormone that's high, have hit one of these pulses when we've done the blood test. Um, so therefore what we do is uh, we load people with sugar. So we know that if you fast and don't eat anything, your growth hormone levels go up. 
And if you eat something, particularly carbohydrates, it suppresses your sugar levels. So we give people 75 grams of refined sugars um, and that suppresses their growth hormone in people who don't have acne regularly. So your level of growth hormone gain would go down to less than 0.3 micrograms per liter. And that would exclude acne regularly. If it doesn't suppress, you probably have got acne regularly. This little yellow line probably wouldn't do anything. If it did, it might go down slightly. But in a lot of patients who have acne regularly, it actually goes upwards, opposite to what you see in health. The next thing we need to do is figure out where the lump or bump is. This is a, the pituitary imaging. We do MR scans now. That is the best way to look at the pituitary. If we look at the one on the left, these little uh, black circles here, on, uh, here are the internal carotid arteries. When they come into your neck, the big arteries that you can feel in your neck come up and turn forwards. And that's what you're seeing. There's little round circles, black circles in the middle of that scan. That's the internal carotid arteries. Between them is the normal pituitary gland. Above it is the little white bit. That's the pituitary stalk that connects the brain to the pituitary gland to tell it how to work. And these are the nerves to the eyes, this little dumbbell shaped thing above the top there. And this is it from the side. The nerves to the eyes run across the top with the pituitary gland just below it and a little stalk coming down to connect it. So that's a normal scan. What do we see in acromegaly when people have got lumps and bumps? Well, the most obvious one is this one on the left-hand side. And we can see this is an enormous pituitary adenoma. Uh, that must be about five or six centimeters. Um, and it's very large, we can see here. All of this shouldn't be here in this one, but we can see from the front. And we can see it's encased the carotids as well here, these little black circles. We can get smaller ones. So the bottom right-hand one is a small tumor, which is more to the uh, on the right hand side of the screen, you can see a small little uh, where it's become uneven. The right side looks a lot bigger than the left side of that pituitary gland between the carotids. And that's a small little microadenoma, which is probably only four or five millimeters inside. And then we can get cystic adenoma, the top on the right, the little one, the black bit in the middle of it is fluid and dead tissue with the adenoma, the actual pituitary tumor surrounding it um, that we can see there. So back to Jack, well, this is Jack's scan, he and his blood test. Jack had a random growth from one of 62, and you can see that's a lot, lot higher than any of those uh, pulses we saw in the profiles um, that I showed you. Um, and a level of 62, usually if you've got a level that high, it's generally di pretty diagnostic of acromegaly. There's very few, even 18 year olds who would have a pulse that's anywhere near 62. So that's a very high level. His IGF-1, normal for his age is around 40. So his level of IGF-1 is about three times the upper limit of normal. So there's no doubt on these blood tests um, that, that Jack has acromegaly. We seem to still, despite there being no doubt, we still tend to go on and do the, the sugar test, so the oral glucose tolerance test. Uh, and his growth hormone only went down to 42, not the less than 0.3 that would declare him as normal. Um, but also on that, we measure the sugar after two hours. And normally you would clear sugar. If you're healthy and you haven't got diabetes, you would clear sugar and your glucose level back below seven by two hours. And obviously in Jack, it's still 12.9. So this gentleman has a high sugar and he's got diabetes as well. Treating, we next need to think about treating Jack and what are we trying to achieve? Um, so what we're trying to achieve with Jack is number one, to make him feel better. Um, so I want to try and improve his symptoms, so his fatigue and his headaches, try and shrink down his hands a little bit. We never manage to reduce all the soft tissues that have got bigger in acromegaly, but they do get better. We can reduce the sweating. Some of the joint pain can get better um, as well. And hopefully all those sexual dysfunction and menstrual cycle things can get better. If the person's got a big tumor, we want to get rid of that so it doesn't grow further and cause problems with the eyes. And obviously, uh, it might be associated with headaches, but we think the headaches are more the secretions from the tumor rather than the tumor bulk. We want to bring the growth hormone levels down to get rid of that excess mortality that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then we also want to try and prevent all those complications from occurring in the first place, or if they're already there, try and reverse some of them, or where we can't reverse them completely, then improve them, like the diabetes and the blood pressure, the sleep apnea. If we can make those all better, then hopefully that makes people feel better as well. What are we trying to aim for? Well, this was work that now is quite a few years ago. This is 20 years ago done in um, New Zealand. Um, and they looked at their population of people with acromegaly, their growth hormone and IGF-1 levels, and how that correlated to mortality. 
And we can see if you've got a growth hormone level more than five, then your mortality is quite high. But the lower your growth hormone gets, the, then the better your outcome is. And if we can get growth hormones less than one, you're exactly the same as the background New Zealand population. And similarly for IGF-1, if your IGF-1 is high, your mortality is higher. But if your, mortality, your IGF-1 is brought to within the normal range, again, we normalize your mortality. So therefore what we want is a growth hormone level below one, and we want a IGF-1, which is normal. So central to achieving that are two things. One, the two things we want to do, one of them is reduce that tumor bulk so we don't get problems with vision. And secondly, we want to get that growth from an IGF-1 level down um, to those targets we just mentioned. So in all, bringing those numbers down of the growth from an IGF-1 improves the symptoms, it lowers the complications, it improves the mortality rate. So these are things we definitely need to do. How do we do it? Well, we've got several options, uh, surgery being one of them. Um, so we can operate and take the tumor away. Radiotherapy will stop the tumor uh, growing, but it, it takes a long time to bring the IGF-1 and growth hormone down. On average, radiotherapy would control about 50% of people, so about one in two people by about seven years. So it really is a very slow modality to bring the growth hormone down, but brilliant for stopping tumor growth. Medical therapy is our last modality, and we've got several groups of drugs only, so somatostatin receptor analogs, and these are things like octreotide and lanreotide that people may have heard of, um, and that's probably our mainstay of medical treatment. And then we have the growth hormone receptor antagonists, which act peripherally, they don't act on the tumor, they actually block the cells from seeing growth hormone, um, so that therefore you don't get all the problems with, with the growth hormone and the IGF-1. Dopaminergics we do use because pituitary tumors uh, express the dopamine receptor and it can switch off the growth hormone, but it's not as effective as the other two. Um, the pegvisimont, the growth hormone receptor antagonist is the most effective drug we have. So surgery is our first option in most people. Um, and then we have to think about, is surgery safe? So uh, our first thing we're gonna think about, what are these complications do we need to make sure are controlled before we go forward with surgery? Uh, diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes is a risk for surgery, so best to get that controlled first. High blood pressure, all anesthetics affect your blood pressure, um, so important we control blood pressure and make sure it's stable before we go forward with uh, any surgery. We need to know about the heart beforehand, so I often do echocardiograms to make sure we have a good idea of what the heart's doing before any surgery. And finally, sleep apnea. It's more difficult if people have sleep apnea to do the anesthetic, to put tubes down and to get people off the ventilator. So really important we know a degree of sleep apnea. If we know it's there beforehand, then it makes everything a lot more simple. It allows us to implement other plans to get people off of the ventilator at the end of surgery as well. So really important we know beforehand. So before I go ahead with surgery and people have got acromegaly, we always do an echocardiogram. We do a sleep apnea assessment we make sure they're not hypertensive. And if diabetes is uncontrolled, we'll help tidy that up before we go forward. Our surgery is pretty much all transphenoidal nowadays. So we don't go through the brain. We go up through your nose, through all those little air sacs that you've got there. And there's a small bit of bone called the sphenoid sinus uh, just below the pituitary gland. So you just have to take a bit of bone out from the bottom of the sphenoid sinus, and then you're at the pituitary. Our pituitary team, our neurosurgeons now have a base of skull surgeon um, who helps them with the surgery and gets them into exactly the right place of where the pituitary is through the sphenoid sinus to make this even more accurate. All of the surgery as well is now endoscopic. So this is similar to what we use to look down into people's tummies. Um, so this means we can look around corners a bit better um, and get much better views than we, we have. And we've exclusively used that in Leeds now since 2009. Back to Jack. Well, Jack's had his pre-surgical investigations. He's got diabetes. His HbA1c is 53. That's good control of diabetes. So diabetes is above 48 and good control is below 58. So he's got good control of his diabetes. So nothing we need to do with him there. His blood pressure is pretty well controlled as well. We start treating blood pressure about 140 over 90. So that's good. He's had an echocardiogram, so a heart scan, which showed his heart contracting nicely. It's of normal size. All the valves are working again, which is brilliant. And he's had a sleep apnea assessment, which he has got a bit of sleep apnea, but it's his uh, apnea hyperapnea index, the AHI, 
only 6.5, which is pretty mild for sleep apnea. It means he's having 6.5 times during his sleep at night when he drops his oxygen levels by about 4%. Anything up to five is normal. So this chap, it's it very mild and not something that would concern us. Should we be treating him before his operation? Probably doesn't need to be um, because we've pretty much got everything under control. There's nothing in his symptoms and, or, or within his complications to say that we need to treat him. If the surgery is going to be delayed, it's worth treating him just so we can try and improve some of his symptoms. And for some of the bigger tumors, I do put people on somatostatin analogs because occasionally we can shrink them down a little bit with these somatostatin analogs. Um, and that hopefully will make surgery a bit easier for the surgeons. But it's very topical. Um, and I'm not sure everyone agrees whether we should do it or not as yet. So Jack underwent his surgery. He had endoscopic transmodal surgery. The surgeon said he got most of the pituitary adenoma out, but there's a little bit on the right-hand side next to the carotid he didn't want to touch because it was on the, the artery. So he's got a little bit left. We debulked it, but not completely resolved his tumor. What do we do next? Well, we next need to assess what impact we've had on his growth hormone levels and his IGF-1. IGF-1 is easy to measure. It's just a standard blood test, but the growth hormone, what we usually do is 30 minute bloods for about three hours. So we get seven measures of the growth hormone and then we average that to see what the growth hormone level is. And we call that a growth hormone day curve. We used to do it every hour through the whole day, but we've sped it up. So it only takes people three hours now. So remember Jack's initial values, his growth hormone was 62, his IGF 123. And now that we've got his surgery undertaken, his growth hormone is down to 8.2. So it's much, much less but still above that target of one that we wanted. His IGF-1 is half of what it was, but again, not yet normal. We have got his HbA1c down to 44, so he no longer has diabetes. He has pre-diabetes, because it's a little bit higher than normal, which is below 41, um, but not in the diabetes range, and his blood pressure is still well controlled. So Jack's doing okay. What are we going to do with Jack next? Well, this is the algorithm that most people would follow, this came out in the Endocrine Society, the American Endocrine Society about 10 years ago, but had representation from the UK in uh, John Wass from Oxford. Um, and the majority of people, as we mentioned, will under undergo surgery as our first treatment. There are obviously a few people on the right which are not well enough to undergo surgery. And then we would think about medical therapy as first line for them. But in after surgery, if we've got people into remission, not Jack, unfortunately, but if we've got people into remission, we're then going to follow them up with the growth hormone day curves and the IGF ones um, to keep a watch on things, um, just to make sure it doesn't come back. If, however, you're more like Jack and you've got persistent disease, we need to think about what to do next. And that glow goes forward to medical therapies. And the ones we mentioned again, mentioned them earlier, somatostatin analogs. So somatostatin, as I mentioned, it's the natural hormone that switches off growth hormone. And what we do is make drugs that last a lot longer and are much more potent than somatostatin itself. Somatostatin lasts two minutes in the body, so it's not much use to us. But these ligands, um, octotide and lamitide, are in long-acting medica long medication now. And these are once monthly injections. Dopaminergics you take once a day. And pegvisolone, as I say, is an injection you give to yourself, which blocks growth from from acting. The other thing we need to mention is radiotherapy. And radiotherapy sits on its own down the bottom there on the left-hand side. And we can use that at any stage of people's treatment um, when we think it's necessary um, and doesn't really follow it somewhere in the pathway. It's something we need to think about and whether it might be useful for an individual. So for Jack, um, where are we next is probably the next thing should be a somatostatin analog analog, uh, somatostatin receptor analog, because that's the next therapy on that algorithm that we would use. And we generally use that in most people, unless they've got very mild disease, in which case we'd use a dopaminergic analog. But we probably, with a growth hormone of uh, eight-ish that Jack had, we'd probably need a somatostatin analog. So for Jack, we tried that. He's got this little residuum left. We put him on a somatostatin analog. He had a lot of side effects because somatostatin analogs also control the gut hormones. So as well as switching off growth hormone, it can switch off some of your gut hormones, which means you can get abdominal cramps and diarrhea and bloating. And the abdominal pains can be quite bad. Most people get them for a few days after the injections and then um, it dissipates. And with in further injections, it tends to get better and better. But um, 
I've had unfortunately had people where the injections cause these problems throughout the whole month and they don't seem to get any better. So they can be problematic for some individuals. So because we were struggling with giving this gentleman his lenrotide and his octreotide, he underwent standard radiotherapy in 2008 um, and continued to struggle with his medication to bring his growth hormone levels under control. And as I say, radiotherapy acts really slowly. So because little had changed in his growth hormone levels by 2010, he actually then went on to have stereotactic, highly focused radiotherapy, which is what we would generally use nowadays, but we did, didn't have that in 2008. Um, available to us routinely. Uh, we do now, but we didn't in that time. So he's now had two different types of radiotherapy to try and bring his growth hormone levels down. And we struggled a bit with his um, medication. He couldn't tolerate the somatostatic analogs because of the GI symptoms. The dopaminergics we tried with him were ineffective in bringing him to target. And this gentleman ended up on pegdisamond. Um, so this was a daily injection to block the actions of growth hormone. Um, in his system and because we're blocking growth from an actin on his liver he didn't make the IGF-1 and his IGF-1 therefore came all the way down to 23.7. Jack was on this drug for about 10, 10 years so we finally brought him his radiotherapy finally kicked in and brought him into remission in about 2020 so he was on medications and his radiotherapy working so we finally stopped it after 10 years so it's taken us a long long time to bring this gentleman's growth hormone levels under control and off of tablets. In addition to all those therapeutic options we've mentioned to treating the tumor, I just thought we should quickly mention the other ones because um, we also need to think about, as well as treating the growth hormone side, all the other hormones that are missing, and we need to think about treating those because people might be missing their thyroid hormones or their natural steroids, and we need to think about that, or their sex hormones, testosterone or estrogen. So we need to think about all those as well parallel to doing all the work we're trying to get the growth hormone under control and obviously thinking about the complications that individuals might have how good are we and how many people need more than one treatments well if we have surgery around 45 to 60 uh, 40 to 65 people uh, percent of people going to remission so on average about 50 percent going to remission with surgery which means we've still got persistent disease after surgery in about 50 percent of our patients we then put in somatostatin analogs as our next line therapy, and that controls about 35% of those um, that haven't been controlled by surgery alone. So that means we then pushed another 19% into remission, but we've still got around 26%. So still around one in four patients after treatment with surgery and somatostatin analogs, which are not yet in that target range of growth from an RGF1 that we want. So um, we do need multimodality therapy, and that's why it's important that we think about do we use radiotherapy and do we mix different kinds of drugs to try and bring them, things under control. How are we doing? Well, the UK Acromegaly database was looked at, and they looked at patients who had a growth hormone of less than two, and we only achieved that in 75% of people. Um, so we're not there yet. The thing that's a bit more reassuring, however, is a lot of patients who we say aren't controlled have very minor disease. So either such that their growth hormone level might be normal and their IGF-1 marginally up, or the other way around where their IGF-1 is normal and their growth hormone marginally up. Uh, and a lot of them are that. So the majority of people who we say are not controlled have very, very minimal disease. They're not running around with growth hormones of 80. Um, they've got growth hormone levels of 1.2, 1.3, or an IGF-1 that's very marginally above the one. So Jack, how's he doing now? Well, Jack's diabetes is resolved. He's got pre-diabetes, but that hasn't changed. It's been pretty stable ever since. His symptoms have improved, but he still feels pretty tired and lethargic. And I often wonder if part of that is being medicalized by us and because he still has a lot of treatments, um, he's still on his... Um, hormones for replacement therapy, none of which we do as well as your body could do. Um, tablets for steroid levels aren't as good as um, your body monitors and changing it every day, similar for the thyroid. So we're never going to be as good as that. So I wonder if that's part of it as well. He also has very bad joint disease. He's back to the rheumatologist every three months for joint injections into his wrists, his ankles, his knees. Uh, but reassuringly, he doesn't have any other complications. Everything else of his screening has been fine. And just quickly to mention surveillance before we start wrapping up, uh, because of all these things, a lot of these things we need to monitor and make sure um, people with acromegaly 
have and that we treat them, catch them early and uh, deal with them. So HbA1c is our marker for diabetes, which we measure on everyone every year when we see them. Blood pressure, important to have measured. Um, echocardiograms, we do every five years um, earlier if there's any abnormalities on it. But once people are controlled and have a normal scan, I stop doing them because once the growth and IGF-1 levels are down to normal, the risk is gone. Similarly for colonoscopies, we do that about every five years. But again, if you're free of polyps and the IGF-1 and growth hormone is then normal, we probably don't need to do that anymore. Uh, bone densitometry is uh, something we look at to check bone mass and make sure that's not too thin. I'm a little on the shelf about doing x-rays routinely for vertebral fractures. And I think really we probably should do x-rays of the spine just when people have back pain and look at it once that's happened, because I'm not sure they add um, before people have trouble because you, if their x-rays are normal, there is nothing you're going to do. You're going to do them after there's a problem. Um, so I think doing them once we've got trouble is probably the way. And MR scans of the Pichurchi, probably not needed because we've got growth hormone and IGF-1, which acts as our tumor marker. So that tells us if your growth hormone or your IGF-1 goes up, that will tell you that your adenoma has got bigger. Um, it generally won't get bigger if the growth hormone and IGF-1 haven't got up. So the more cells you've got, the higher the growth hormone and IGF-1. So as you've got a tumor marker, routine scanning really, really isn't a necessity in this condition. What can we do better? Well, there's obviously a few things and probably central is picking up this condition earlier um, because we know if we diagnose it earlier, we can improve the long-term outcomes. And there is absolutely no doubt about that. And that's part of why we were talking to GPs earlier in the year. Um, we also need to recognize that the more features people have, the more likely they are going to have with the diagnosis of acromegaly. So we need to think of those people. And I say it's thinking about it if we don't think of it, we don't make the diagnosis. We're moving into areas now of more acceptable medical therapies. So I think the somatostatin and lungs have been a big needle into a muscle, um, classically every 28 days, which a lot of people find painful. They can find it can wear off towards the end of the therapy. And so we now have several other newer somatostatin lungs that are coming through. We've got a new oral preparation called Paratacetine, which is different to the other somatostatin and lungs and looks to be a very good tablet. It will be a once a day tablet. It's now going through licensing with the FDA and will come to Europe. We've been using it in clinical studies now for two or three years um, and seems to be effective. Um, we've also been trialing a once monthly subcutaneous injection, much smaller needle and that people could just inject themselves in a single use device, once monthly injection, but small needle and people can do it themselves rather than having to come to hospitals or GP surgeries for it. So that would be uh, much more acceptable. And shortly we're starting trials using a three monthly um, somatostatin uh, analog. So there would be the same, it'd be octreotide, but in a preparation that lasts three monthly. So the injections will need to be done less often. And hopefully it will stop that uh, period where people tend to fail towards the inject next injection coming up that it stops working. In radiotherapy, we're moving towards Proton. There's two Proton centers now in the UK, one in Manchester at the Christie and one at UCL in London. Um, this is a new form of radiotherapy that doesn't use photons, which are basically beams of light of high energy, uh, which is photons, protons and mass particles. Um, and so you don't get the scatter. What you aim at, you hit. Uh, you don't get scatter and cause damage to other tissues surrounding it. So we're hoping by using Proton will cause less problems to the normal tissues. And I think that's where we'll stop. So now we can uh, add any questions in and uh, hand back to our chairs.